Welcome everyone. It's day two of the 2020 Freedom from Slavery Forum. I am your host today. My name is Sean McDonald. I'm CEO of Verite. Our day two focus is advocacy. We will be looking back to discuss how the Palermo Protocol and the Trafficking Victims Protection Act have shaped the modern anti-slavery movement. And we will be looking forward to see how Alliance 8.7 and groups around the globe are working on many fronts to end modern slavery. Today's gathering is a partnership of the Freedom from Slavery Forum and the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition at Yale University. We have a terrific program for you for the next 90 minutes with speakers joining us from France, Canada, India, Ghana, and United States. Let me briefly review our presenters today. Anushe Karvar is the chair of Alliance 8.7 and will be our keynote speaker. David Light directs the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale University and will introduce a pre-taped presentation from former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Professor Blight will also introduce Ambassador Lou DeVaca, also from Yale, who will moderate a terrific discussion with Charlotte Oldham Moore from the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Cheryl Pereira from One Child Canada, Deepika Mittal from the Global March Against Child Labor, and Joha Braima from Free the Slaves Ghana. Before we begin the program, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the advisory committee to express our thanks and gratitude to the Elks Foundation for their vital support to this forum. As we go along today, if you have questions for the panelists, please put them into the question and answer thread, which you can see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will call on you. And of course, we invite comments in the chat. Please be sure to enter your name and organization and location into the chat so that we will have that for our report and so that others will see where you're coming from. Now, please welcome our first speaker, Anouche Carvar. She is the French government's representative to the International Labor Organization, and she serves as the chair of Alliance 8.7. Over to you, Anouche. Thank you very much, Sean. And thank you very much to the organizers for convening this important event. I'm honored to be here, and I'm really impressed by this virtual mobilization. We need this mobilization more than ever in the current context as the impact of the pandemic may reverse years and years of progress in the fight against modern uh, slavery and trafficking in persons. We know that the dramatic increase in poverty exposes the most vulnerable and we must make sure all actors, including governments and international organizations, strengthen their efforts to protect them from human rights violation. In the past 20 years, great advances have been made in the global efforts to end trafficking in persons. The UN protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, supplementing the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized crime adopted in the year 2000 provided the first internationally agreed definition of trafficking in persons. After 20 years of a near universal ratification, the Palermo Protocol has provided an international framework that has not only facilitated the adoption of national legal frameworks to combat the crime, but also impelled a global anti-trafficking and anti-slavery movement encouraging cooperation amongst governments and between governments and intergovernmental organizations, as well as civil society organization. Since the protocol's adoption, according to UNODC, more than two thirds of UN member states have criminalized human trafficking as in the definition of article three frameworks such as the US Trafficking Victims Protection Act have been also very instrumental. One main contribution to shaping the responses to fighting this crime is the three P paradigm. Fighting trafficking in persons should be centered on the prevention, 
of the crime, protection of victims, and prosecution of perpetrators. But later on, a fourth P was added, partnerships. And I'd like to put the emphasis on this. The dreadful practices we are dealing with are multidimensional and transnational in nature. Tackling them requires coordination of policies and entities at the global and country levels. Let's be clear, individually, we won't eradicate the scourge of human trafficking. We need to work together under our various mandates and bearing in mind our specificities as international organizations, civil society, businesses, and governments. But we must go beyond consulting each other. We must now take concrete actions. The ILO and Free the Slaves have already shown the way. In line with the Bangkok statement adopted in 2018, concrete action and collaboration have been undertaking in the framework of the Alliance 8.7, relying on each other's expertise. For instance, the Alliance 8.7 global estimates have greatly benefited from Free the Slaves Global Slavery Index. Clearly, it's just an example and such precedents call for more. My priority as chair of the Alliance is also to make sure that this multi-stakeholder approach is a reality on the ground, not just in words. All actors, including NGOs, should work together in the 22 Pathfinder countries that we have. This is the reason why we have been working within the Alliance 8.7 for a stronger framework of engagement with Pathfinder countries when they develop their national strategies to achieve target 8.7, including child labor, forced labor, human trafficking, and modern slavery. I also believe it is key to strengthen the mon monitoring and evaluation process to make sure getting the Pathfinder status is not the end of the journey, but rather a critical step in the process of putting together all energies in favor of achieving target 8.7. For this to become a reality, your commitment at the global and country levels is essential. Please be assured that with the Alliance, you have at your disposal a forum to directly engage with other key actors and please, be sure that in the process, my door will always be open to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anushe, for helping us understand the Alliance and its strategy to achieving Sustainable Development Goal 8.7. We will be sure to put a link to Global Alliance 8.7 in the chat for everybody to link to. Let's now turn the program over to a distinguished scholar of American history and of slavery in the abolition movement, Professor David Blight of Yale, who directs the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Over to you, David. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sean, and thank you, Anushe, for that wonderful opening. Uh, let me just briefly say it's a thrill to be here with all of you, all of the distinguished guests here and participants um, who have worked on this problem of modern slavery uh, most of your lives. Um, I congratulate you first on this 20th anniversary of the US Trafficking Victims Protection Act and the Palermo Protocol. I can't help being reminded as a historian of 19th century slavery and anti-slavery that this is what the American Anti-Slavery Society did uh, as well as the British anti-slavery societies, they would hold their 10th anniversary and their 15th and their 20th and remind themselves of what they were all about and they were still holding those on their 30th and 40th anniversary as, I'm, as I, I know that fortunately and unfortunately all of you will too. And I must say too, if anyone's following the chat as I am, it is frankly amazing. Uh, we, have, we have guests and people from all over the world, all kinds of organizations and uh, it's a thrill for us at the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale to be a small part of this. 
we've had a modern slavery initiative going now for approximately 10 years. And now we're um, especially grateful to have Lou DeBaca here as our modern slavery fellow who helps organize everything we do about this subject as he has this program as well. Um, my first task is simply to introduce uh, Secretary Clinton and the film we're about to watch. Uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, who I suppose needs no introduction, but we give people proper introductions, uh, served as the 67th Secretary of State of the United States, Senator from New York. Um, she was First Lady of the United States, First Lady of Arkansas. She was the first woman to run as the presidential candidate of a major American party. In the election of 2016, she uh, uh, won the popular vote by almost 3 million votes. She is a graduate of the Yale Law School and of Wellesley College. And as I'm sure all of you know, she has been very active in anti-trafficking policy making for a very long time, since at least the mid 1990s, which has grown out of her work on international women's issues. So here in a taped uh, video done especially for this occasion is Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Every year as Secretary of State, I would host the Trafficking in Persons Report rollout. After the event was over, anti-trafficking advocates would stay for hours talking and strategizing, you know, sometimes to the chagrin of the State Department fire marshals, who were always shocked at the size of the crowd. The Freedom from Slavery Forum presents an opportunity to come together once again around this critical shared mission. I'm very glad to have a chance to participate virtually. Thanks to Dr. David Blight for your work through the Gilder Lerman Center. Thanks as well to Bukeni Waruzi and your team at Free the Slaves We've come a long way since International Women's Day in 1998, when we challenged the world to adopt the 3P paradigm of prevention, protection, and prosecution. The decade of development that followed saw the sharpening of our understanding of this issue, the adoption of domestic legislation, and the growth of best practices. As secretary, I was proud to call for a shift into a decade of delivery and what a productive decade it has been. In the US, we've added the fourth P of partnership and work to hold ourselves to our own standards. Around the globe, we are almost at universal ratification of the Palermo Protocol. Countries that once denied they had human trafficking in their borders are now finally confronting this crime. And as we mark the 20th anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and the United Nations Trafficking Protocol, we have a chance to assess the state of the field. Because the truth is, we still have a long way to go. Too few victims are identified and even fewer get the help they need. Those who are identified are often only given short-term assistance. And labor trafficking, whether of women, men, or children, continues to be an afterthought for too many jurisdictions. So today, I'm calling for a decade of determination. It is time to take stock of our efforts, to determine what is working and what is not. And most importantly, we must stay determined. I'm proud that the last two decades have seen so many people from different countries, faith traditions, and ideologies commit to tackling this issue. And I know that together, we'll be able to deliver on the promise of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that no one on this earth will be held in slavery or servitude. Thank you for all you're doing, and let's keep going. Wow. Well. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. <laughs> and uh, thank you to Lou DeBaca and others who arranged to have uh, Mrs. Clinton uh, tape that for us. Uh, what a challenge, what a, what a thrill actually to see 
<laughs> uh, such intelligent, solid, informed leadership uh, on, on such an important international issue. Uh, and my next role is simply to introduce my dear friend, Lou DeBaca, who uh, is, I'm sure, known by all of you. Uh, Lou is a legend in this field, a pioneer to say the least, as are many of, many of the rest of you. Um, Lou's a native of Iowa. Uh, he went to the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, he uh, was a legendary litigator in the US Justice Department from 1993 to about 2007. Uh, he pioneered the victim-centered approach to prosecution using the 13th Amendment. Uh, in fact, revived use of the 13th Amendment, among others. Um, to fight uh, trafficking and modern forms of slavery. He's one of the most decorated federal prosecutors in the United States. In the State Department, uh, under the Obama administration, he ran the office to monitor and combat human trafficking and help develop the TIP reports, the annual TIP reports. Um, he was earlier uh, the counsel for the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee, and he uh, negotiated this uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act some 20 years ago. And last but not least, and there's a lot that can be said about Lou's work, uh, we're thrilled to have him here now at Yale as the Gilder Lehrman Center's uh, Senior Fellow in Modern Slavery, where he has done so many things uh, to help us develop this field and including um, a working group that we convened here for more than two years and indeed that group is about to publish a book of essays that came out of it with Cambridge University Press this winter edited by Genevieve LeBaron and Jessica Pliley. Uh, Lou, uh, Lou wrote the, inter no, I wrote the introduction and Lou wrote the afterward or is it the other way around I forget. <laughs> And that book is called Fighting Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking, History and Contemporary Policy. Uh, and now we turn this over to, you know, from the celebration to the analysis of this field. And uh, now over to you, Lou, and Lou DeBaca will moderate uh, this extraordinary panel to come. Welcome to everybody and thank you, Lou. Well, hello everybody. And thank you, David. Uh, thank you to everybody at the uh, forum. Um, and uh, let's, uh, as David said, move from commemoration uh, to the type of determination that Secretary Clinton uh, suggested that we should have um, in fighting this together. Um, I want to introduce um, uh, our first part of the panel. It's going to be a discussion about, uh, about a 20 minute discussion between uh, me and Charlotte Olden Moore. Uh, Charlotte uh, is somebody who um, many of you uh, hopefully know, and uh, those of you who don't, uh, I think it's just going to be a real treat uh, for uh, you to have a chance to, to know her the way that some of us do. Uh, the reason I say that some of you might not is because uh, in many ways, uh, Charlotte has been uh, the engine uh, that drives uh, us, uh, especially on the policy and the leg legislative policy side uh, over the last few decades. Um, but because she has so many things on her plate, uh, she's not unique uh, to human trafficking. Um, I'm going to do a, just a very quick introduction and, and then uh, we can bring her in. Um, Charlotte Older-Moore is a senior professional staff member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, she handles the uh, global issues portfolio for uh, S Senator Menendez, who's the uh, ranking member. Um, her portfolio includes humanitarian assistance, the United Nations, migration and refugees, human rights, atrocity prevention, and human trafficking. Now there's a part of the State Department um, that handles most of those things. Uh, and that is the under, Office of the Undersecretary uh, for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. Um, in the State Department, of course, we have to have acronyms for everything. So for some reason that's called J. Um, so what we decided was that we just call that justice. Um, and that's certainly uh, what, uh, as Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, Charlotte very much fought for. Before that, she was staff director of the executive, uh, the, excuse me, the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Uh, she was senior counsel to Senator Barbara Boxer. Uh, and uh, most uh, relevant, I think, to today's 
uh, commemoration, she was uh, senior policy advisor to Senator Paul Wellstone. Uh, the late Senator Wellstone uh, was the uh, main Senate driver on the Democratic side, and it was his uh, piece of legislation that ended up uh, being passed into law as the TBPA. Um, Charlotte also uh, comes from uh, backgrounds similar to many of us on the, the call uh, coming out of the NGO community uh, with uh, Time at Save the Children, Disability Rights International, and the International Human Rights Group. Um, she holds a JD from Columbia University and a BA in Chinese history from Wesleyan. Um, and let's bring her on and talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're going. Charlotte? Hi, Lou. It's wonderful. I don't know if you can see me. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, you and I, well, I, I like to watch you do battle at the State Department <laughs> when I was at State, when all the regional bureaus were pushing back, wanting to downplay the extent of trafficking in the countries and you put up a good fight to make sure that the tip report was credible, honest, candid, uh, and that was a fight. <laughs> so uh, it's a real honor to see you today and to be with everybody here, as particularly with the civil society because uh, you make everything we do possible. And I say that without any um, flourish, it's quite serious. Uh, so it's a great honor to be here. Excellent. Well, let's let's just jump right in because, as as you mentioned, you know this sometimes is not um, you know it, we think that everybody would want to fight slavery, um, and everybody does want to fight slavery. But there's so many other things that we also do, whether it's in foreign policy or policy making, even in the NGO community, people who um, might not want to have slavery or might not want to have human trafficking, but they're busy doing environmental work or they're busy doing, you know, girls schools or, you know, things like that. Um, can you maybe reflect for us on kind of how the trafficking issue started to shine through in the, in the late 1990s when you were working for Senator Wellstone? How did sure. it penetrate all of those other very important issues? Yeah, I think in some ways it was a perfect storm of a lot of different threads we had brilliant and relentless civil society who brought it to our attention. And we had great journalism. And journalism is critical in this, getting the story out. And so when I was working with Senator Wellstone, uh, media was covering uh, the movement of women out of the former Soviet Union into Israel. That captured a lot of people's attention. Uh, and we had Kevin Bale's uh, book, uh, and there were stories percolating up. At the same time, you had members of the Senate and the House who were profoundly committed to human rights and really believed that you could get something done in this space. And they knew that the only way you can really ever get anything done is through bipartisanship, through left-right coalitions. You can't, I, I'm a proud Democrat, I'm a progressive. Uh, but I really believe I've got to work with my Republican colleagues to get good work done. And so they really understood that. So Senator Wellstone and his wife, Sheila Wellstone, were just like the old style labor activists. They were passionate about vulnerable people. Uh, they were committed to the hard work of lifting their voices. They understood what human slavery was about. They found partnership in Senator Brownback, Chris Smith, Tom Lantos in the House. These were Democrats. Republicans who had very different um, voting records, uh, but worked together. And then they had really passionate staff who believed strongly in human rights. At the time, my brother was a detective in New York City's uh, major case squad, and he was taking kidnapping victims, women who uh, were enslaved, and trying to find shelter for them. And they, he couldn't find any place to put the, no shelters would take them. And so I learned through his work just what a difficult issue this was. And I knew I wanted to work on it. Well, one of the things that was interesting, um, and this isn't all about me, but I will uh, share a couple yeah, of anecdotes hey. as well. But, you know, one of the things that was interesting from our perspective in the, the Civil Rights Division is that, you know, there had been in 1996, the Immigration Reform Act and uh, the Welfare Reform Act that really cut off some of the avenues that we'd been using to house victims, to keep them working in the United States, to keep them from being deported, et cetera. And it was just interesting to see even anti-immigrant um, Congress people coming together um, 
And I don't know if that was because, you know, there was a few survivors that came and testified, um, you know, kind of how we were able to move both from us who were working on it from in the, the administration, but then also you and the other congressional staff being able to really appeal to the, I guess, for lack of a better word, better angels of their nature um, with folks who normally would be voting against social programs and voting against immig pro-immigrant um, legislation. Yeah, no, I think part of it is, is that, you, as you said, you know, I can't, I've been working on legislation, moving legislation for 20 years, and I just can't overstate how, much, how important good, active, relentless civil society is, and also the connections, the heart connections with, uh, with the people who are impacted. And so you have to have the technocratic, you have to have the deep understanding of the social problems, the interlocking issues that need to be unpacked. But for politicians who have so many competing issues on their agenda and leaders who have, there's just, there's a bumper crop of real problems to contend with, uh, to have that connection with survivors was transformative for many of them, absolutely transformative because what was on paper and what was conceptual became enormously real and they could tangibly touch that problem, hug that problem, understand that problem in a profound way. And so I think at that time we had civil society NGOs who were helping members to connect with that experience, either when they went overseas uh, to visit embassies or foreign governments, the local, the, um, the, NG, the, uh, the uh, foreign affairs FSO, the foreign affairs officer at the embassy would connect these members uh, with um, uh, NGOs on the ground. I know with my, my boss that happened when he went to in Mumbai, uh, Senator Wellstone in the 90s uh, met with women who were affected and um, brick kiln workers. And so that kind of um, having that really good foundational policy background that the NGOs gave them, plus that personal connection was huge. And I wanna say one thing just real fast. I think, you know, the pandemic, um, is a horrific, horrific, uh, a horrific dynamic in the world today, and uh, that you know more people will die from starvation than the pandemic potentially because of how you know the necessary but very uh, secondary impacts of the of the policy decisions being made. But in some weird ways, it presents opportunities because you know you this everybody's using virtual spaces. So in the old days, you had to travel. Now you can do the virtual space. And I think in terms of connecting staff, members, policymakers with survivors, with NGOs on the ground, this is a real opportunity because you don't have to say, oh, I'll be in DC in three months. Can we get a meeting then? Pay all that money, all that frustration. You can really try to set those meetings up now and connect people across uh, across continents. And I, I've been a participant in some of that and it's been very profound for me personally. How do you, when you're, when you're responding to that and when you're thinking about um, kind of that blend between the kind of technocratic policy making, um, you know, let's do a study and then let's figure out how to put that into, into legislation um, versus, um, or not even versus, but you know, how the, how the heart and head complement each other. Um, one of the things that I'm struck by is that this wasn't a one and done piece of legislation, you know, passing it in 2000. Um, and then it's like, okay, we've got it. It's, you know, there were multiple re reauthorizations, um, some of which um, you've worked on uh, on the Hill, some of which happened while you were uh, in the administration. Um, how do you see Kind of slipping out of the kind of 20 years ago moment but how do you see that continued arc of the last 20 years uh, with the legislative work and how it complements what's going on out in the field around the world yeah i mean it's interesting you know the, the technically these bills and i kind of i get frustrated with it as a staff person but i think chris smith may have done this he set these bills up to expire very quickly. Like when we draft legislation, it is so consuming. I mean, the TVPA, honestly, was one of the hardest, most difficult, unpleasant 
experiences, professional experience I've ever had. I, to put that together, we had all these shenanigans from members. We had just very difficult policy issues. We had it in the press. Our, our, some of our bosses were being pilloried for you know, being pro-sex prostitution. I mean, it was just crazy. Uh, but we, well, and then when you put labor standards on top of that, I mean, yeah. you know, sex and the role of workers, those are yeah. two real easy and, issues to deal with, right? And we had, um, be honest, be, we had enormous ignorance. I mean, both on the staff level, among the community, the American population. At that point, there was not a body of information people could easily tap into to inform them making good policy. And I think one of the dangers with NGOs is they think, I told you that last year, don't you know? You know, this kind of relentless education needs to take place. So getting back, the TVPA was a very hard thing to put together, but the brilliance of some of our members was instead of saying like, I would like as a staff level, we did a great job, let's walk away and work on some other fire, you know, hair on fire problem. Some of our legislators were really smart and they said, you know what, we're gonna make this law expire every three to five years. And so we have to go back in it and perfect it and back in it and perfect it. And so I think that has been really smart. And that's been a prompter for the NGO community, the members to get in a room and talk about this stuff and re have that sense of determine, recommit, be re-energized. Um, and so that's been a kind of, that's going to be kind of like a systematic thing that's been built in. The other is some of the NGOs have done really good jobs of doing annual events, which prompted us to do annual real hard work on the issue, which, you know, increased our commitment. Uh, some of that has worn out. I think the other thing that's happened anyway. Yeah. So long winded answer to your question. Well, I guess one of the, as far as keeping it from wearing out, um, you know, the, the idea that for a national government, having these things that help prompt or drive um, responses, and that can even be that you need to take time out to, you know, brief up, you know, a member or, or time to, to write a, a script for, um, you know, the president, if he's going to be going to the G20 or something, um, if you know that it's going to be on the agenda. How do you feel that the international organizations, whether it's, you know, we heard from Anishay this morning, um, you know, whether it's something like the SDGs, whether it's the General Assembly itself or the, the Geneva-based human rights uh, or the UNODC uh, in Vienna, how do those then play in from your experience to what policymakers in a national government end up responding to or trying to push? Yeah, it's very, very interesting. The Palermo Protocol was really important. I think you, the United States right now is extremely inward looking. And I think, you know, under the current administration, our relationship with the UN, we've sort of retreated a bit in the multilateral spaces, but more like over a longer period of time, I think it's it, that, that back and forth is really very important. With the SDGs, I'm a little concerned because we don't have, you know, um, some of the safe, mig well, we have safe migration, but we don't have refugees in there. We don't mm -hmm. have migrants in there as much as they need to be. Um, I think a lot of the trafficking space, we need to start thinking about it in the terms of migration. I think we're going to have 300 million people on the move in just a couple of decades. And Understanding that with trafficking, I think that it's a little bit stovepiped, and I think we need to better integrate that in terms of the global forced migration problem. And the UN is doing much more work in that space than some of the national governments in an effective way. Uh, so that dynamic, I think, is quite important. Um, yeah, I, what do you think? Because you work in this space all the time on that, in terms of the, the multilateral space, the UN, those instruments with the impact on the national government. Because I think at DOJ, you may have seen more of that than I did in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I mean, it's interesting. The United States context, I think, is very different. Um, the United States is, tends to be historically a real player over the last 80 years in kind of the development of international law and international norms, um, but then doesn't necessarily um, live them internally on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I recall we did a bilateral um, agreement with Italy back in 98, 99, um, 
And one of the things we agreed on was that we'd uh, work with Argentina and others on, on pursuing the protocol. Um, but what was interesting is that we got done, you know, the US uh, negotiators on the bilat um, came back from, in, from Italy and within a week, the Italians had sent a blast fax to every police station saying, here are the 10 questions you need to ask of every African woman who you find in prostitution. Now it was a narrow definition of, of and conception of trafficking. It was 1998, it was a little clumsy, very carceral uh, in its approach, um, but they did it. Um, we, on the other hand, at DOJ, there's 17,000 police forces, not 17,000 police officers, but 17,000 different police forces. And it's not like Attorney General Reno could send a fax out to every police officer in the country ordering them to do something because they didn't work for her. Um, and so I think the US system is not, you know, the international stuff is not front of mind in the way that it is someplace else's. Um, you go to Africa, you go to, to, to Europe, and you know, a police sergeant detective will actually, you know, quote, you know, victim care standards from the European or the AU um, guidelines or directives. <clears throat> In the United States, it's not like that. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that's been tough with the US is that I think that it it at the kind of national policy making, it gives us a standard to try to to aspire to, um, and it gives us something that we can point to and say, you know, we need to meet this standard because, you know, all of our partners around the world are reaching for this particular standard. But it isn't necessarily informing da daily police practices the way that it would in the Czech Republic or something like that. So that's been a little bit frustrating, I think, over time. Um, but I think it shows that, you know, Bilateral and multilateral work does matter um, because you can measure yourself against it. At the end of the day, that's really, I think, what it comes down to is measurement um, and not just giving a speech, not just you know signing an executive order saying you don't like trafficking, but actually going out and doing the cases and helping the victims. I think that is so well said, Lou. And I mean, I, I worry broadly that we, we are not, uh, engaged in a way we need to be in the multilateral space, in the UN space, in terms of the sort of an American exceptionalism. We, you know, we got this. We don't need to worry. You know, you, we don't need your help. We got this. But the fact we don't have this, and we could be much better at the work we do if we played more and learn more uh, from the UN system, the multilateral system, and and I think one of the most concerning things I've seen in my career is the retreat in many ways from the US, not just retreat, but uh, just what you said, that you're, you're in a much more um, uh, specific, but just on a macro level, our engagement has shrunk. Uh, and I think uh, that is profoundly worrying and we need to learn from our, uh, our brothers and sisters from other countries. We need to really aggressively participate in the multilateral, institutions and incorporate what we learn and bring it back home and not just leave it on the shelf, which I fear that we do do a lot. I guess one last question, because I know we don't have you uh, forever and, and we've got a, a great other panel that we're going to be bringing in. Um, you know, we in the United States, we're set up um, with three branches. And, and if I roughly, um, you know, have occupied the executive branch space and you've roughly uh, occupied the legislative branch space uh, throughout the years. Um, what about the judges? You know, I've, I kind of feel like we all, in retrospect, in, 20, in the year 2000, we figured we'll, let, we'll pass a law. Um, and then we'll have a law and we'll get to go out and use it. Um, and the judges necessarily want to be independent and they you know, tend to say, well, I'll bring a you know, I'll look at the case if, if litigants bring it in front of me. Um, but that's so different than what, you know, whether it was with INL, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, uh, whether it's the TIP office, you know, all of these J-line foreign assistance um, structures that were doing judicial training all over the world. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't really remember us thinking in 2000, what do the American judges need? 
I totally agree with you. I don't think that was at all on our radar. And we had a judge, for, uh, former judge helped draft this, which was, you know, Jacob Reese, who was a former chief judge of, uh, of Samoa. Uh, it's a really good point. I mean, I think we didn't think of a lot of things and, and you know, the complexity uh, of this problem and the, all the players, I don't think we realized how many people would be involved in trying to solve this problem. Uh, but specifically on the judges, I think you're exactly right. Um, I'm actually kind of worried right now. We have the Coco case before the Supreme Court uh, on the Alien Tort Claims Act. And that could be struck down. And that was a real remedy for these uh, enslaved people who, these children who worked in the cocoa plantations in Ghana. Uh, and we just went on an amicus brief now and it's gone up to the Supreme Court. Um, but anyway, the line judges, I think you're exactly right about that. So last, last thoughts, last reflections, um, as far as the, maybe the next 20 years, how do you take this forward? both legislatively and with your own personal activism? Yeah, it's a great point. I, I'm so grateful to have Secretary Clinton's message. She's amazing, she's relentless. And I think it really is about being relentless. And really, even though we talk ourselves out of it, you, everyone in, in this who's listening and watching this has made a difference. And we all think sometimes, some of us think, oh, we really haven't, but we have made a difference. And we've got to believe we can continue to make a difference. And for me, I think I'm going to look more broadly at migration policy because I think that's not understood, international migration policy. I'm doing a bill right now on global forced migration. It's going to have a trafficking component. Uh, I think that's a space that we in the United States has really not done well with. We've left the protocol, we've left the compacts on global forced mi on migration, mm -hmm. on refugees. So that's where I'm taking my trafficking work. Um, but I'm just really grateful for you, Lou, you're like, you're battling and your work all these years and really for civil society in India, Ghana, everywhere that I've visited. Uh, I can't thank you people enough for what you do. It's just enormously important. Um, so I draw strength from you and I draw inspiration from you. And I hope when the pandemic is over, I can get back on the road and, and meet people again. Excellent. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for uh, being with us this morning. Um, and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye-bye. You bet. Um, so we've got a, a great panel uh, coming up on uh, the kind of the, how do we then take uh, from that uh, and uh, move it into action both for today and going forward? You know, the two big themes, the thematic questions for uh, this day of the conference or A, how have the, the TVPA and the Palermo Protocol shaped the anti-slavery movement, but also how can we galvanize uh, coordinated global action to more effectively serve enslaved individuals and vulnerable populations? And so I'm just tickled that we're able to, to bring in uh, three folks who have been such leaders on that. Um, and um, I'll do quick introductions, um, and then we're gonna have uh, each of our panelists uh, give a little bit of information about uh, what they're working on, uh, what their organizations do, uh, and then we'll go into uh, Q&A amongst ourselves, as well as uh, with all of you, uh, hopefully feeding in um, on the Q&A part of Zoom, not on the chat part of Zoom. Um, I'll remind you of that uh, a little bit here and there. Um, but introductions. Uh, Cheryl Pereira um, from Canada, children's rights activist. She began as a teenager um, when she founded uh, One Child. Uh, One Child Canada actually uh, basically says that children should be involved uh, with policy making uh, around uh, these issues, uh, especially of child sex tourism. Uh, and Cheryl and her team pushed successfully for Canada uh, through the, the Canadian Tourism Board, Air Canada, the government itself, everybody to actually confront and address child sex tourism. Uh, she was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum uh, and uh, is able to, to join us today. Um, I'm gonna introduce everybody and then I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl. Uh, so um, uh, remember what I'm about to say about uh, the other two. Uh, Deepika Mittal uh, is at the Global March Against Child Labor. Uh, she's the head of um, campaign. She's the communications coordinator. Um, she has a banking background, uh, which is I think a lot of us are seeing in the anti-trafficking movement that people with financial um, knowledge uh, are becoming more and more valuable 
as we realize that this is about money flows as well as uh, people. Um, but uh, she takes her uh, master's in international business from uh, Delhi School of Economics uh, and her ba bachelor's in econ uh, from, from Delhi University. And she brings that uh, into play uh, on behalf of uh, children uh, and uh, other excluded populations. Um, I also want to introduce uh, Dr. Joha Bramia. Um, uh, Joha uh, is um, the West Africa coordinator for Free to Slaves. Uh, he's on the executive board of the International Cocoa Initiative. Um, he holds a PhD in migration studies from the University of Ghana uh, and an MPhil in social work, um, also from the University of Ghana. Um, and I just want to quote um, uh, him uh, from a meeting that he and I had uh, some years back, um, because I think that it really tees off what we're going to try to say today, um, which he says that uh, they have to you have to look at changing local acceptance of slavery by awakening community, community members to the fact that slavery is even illegal and the need to overcome it through collective action. It's not to dole out money, but to find committed individuals in the community and help them act as agents of change. We are so lucky to have such agents of change with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl, if you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Canada. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, I think I'd like to kind of start with a bit of a story. Um, you know, I was researching for a high school project um, when I was 16 years old and I stumbled across a description of the child sex trade or child sex trafficking in Thailand. Now, I, at the time, I couldn't really wrap my brain around how an industry could be organized around the rape of children that were my age and younger. And so even as a kid, you know, I refused to see myself as a bystander and I knew that I was going to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I was going to do something. And, you know, as I read on, I learned that Sri Lanka, which happened to be the birthplace of my parents, was home to about 40,000 trafficked children. I wanted to hear their stories of exploitation and abuse and ask them what I could do as a kid to kind of help. And so when I was 17, you know, I convinced my parents and my high school principal to let me take three and a half months off of school to travel to Sri Lanka alone on a fact-finding mission um, on child exploitation, where I traveled around the country meeting with traffic children, with NGOs, with law enforcement and government officials. Um, but talking to them wasn't really enough. I wanted to get an insider's look into the child, into child sex trafficking. And so I actually approached the National Child Protection Authority of Sri Lanka and the police, and they offered me the opportunity to play the main role of the decoy, which would be a 15 year old sexually exploited child in undercover operation to catch a child sex perpetrator that they had been following. And so my role was essentially to be the bait and to meet with him. Uh, once he made the payment, we would leave to go to a hotel and that would be the cue for the police to make in and, and, and make the bust. So, you know, I trained with the police. I learned how to work with spy technology and fake an accent. And on that day of our meeting, we spoke, he spoke to me in very graphic detail, the kind of sexual services he was interested in getting from me, who he thought was a 15 year old girl. Um, that experience, you know, of going undercover really opened my eyes and we were in the able, in the end, we were able to arrest that child sex perpetrator. Um, and I decided to take my experience of going undercover and, and, and meeting with the children to the advisor to the president of Sri Lanka on social infrastructure and, and share with her my experiences and, and what the children had told me. Um, at that point, you know, I was offered a position to serve as the president of Sri Lanka's nominee on child protection. Um, but I knew that the work had to be done. There was much more work to be done in Canada. And, and so when I returned, I spoke to anyone who was willing to listen and interest started, interest started to bubble among young people. I started traveling from high school to high school to high school, speaking out about this issue and educating young people. And despite you know, the fact that they are the most affected by trafficking, you know, um, young people were not being given the opportunity to have their, their same solutions or given the tools to kind of work towards these solutions. Um, and so essentially I decided to tap you know, into the expertise of young people and I founded One Child um, with a group of friends, some as young as 13 years old, to empower a youth-led movement to take action against child sex trafficking through education, through advocacy, survivor care, and survivor empowerment. Now, I just have a, I just wanna share a few pictures if that's possible. Oops. 
Yes. Um, so this is actually the, the, the founding members of the organization. Um, over the years, you know, we have um, presented at, in terms of, if we look at the Palermo Protocol and we look at some of the different P's, the, the four P's and what we've done, um, we have presented over 230 schools across Canada and the US. Um, we have uh, educated students as well as teachers um, about the scope of the, the scale of trafficking, about recruitment tactics, root causes, um, what are the signs of a potential trafficking situation, what are the vulnerabilities and where to seek support. Um, and so this picture is just outlined some of the, or just gives you an idea of, of the type of work that we do. We also speak, um, we also use role models, male role models to speak to boys about gender discrimination, um, about harmful stereotypes, um, that demand, the demand that's perpetuated by men and what it means to be a male ally. Um, we provide a youth-friendly hub on information on child sex trafficking. We provide action campaigns that youth can run in their schools and their communities. And we train students to be advocates, uh, to advocate their government for, to introduce child safe policies. Um, we have also partnered in the past with organizations to provide anti-trafficking training for law enforcement, for judges, for courtroom officials, so that justice is served for survivors and traffickers don't escape um, with the impunity. We've also uh, taken a victim-centered approach. So we partnered with the Pareda Foundation in the Philippines, for instance, to provide immediate and long-term recovery by providing a safe a building, a sanctuary for girl victims of sex trafficking. So any girls at any given time can stay at the center and they receive shelter, um, uh, non-formal and formal education, vocational skills training, therapy, medical assistance, legal assistance, um, and human rights training and leadership training. In terms of partnerships, um, as, as Lou mentioned, in Canada, One Child pioneered the private sector's engagement on the issue of sex, uh, sexual exploitation of children and travel and tourism which often, as we know, overlaps with child sex trafficking. Um, focusing on the travel and tourism industry, our youth lobbied Air Canada to screen youth produced in-flight videos that warn against the humanitarian and legal consequences of engaging in this crime and to inspire passengers to remain vigilant and to report suspicious activity. Now the campaign reached over 22 million passengers and inspired action from other airlines in Canada, as well as the hospitality industry. So this was kind of the, the, the impetus um, to kind of get more, to, to bring about more action from the industry. So for instance, once, we, once Air Canada started playing videos, then later on, they went on to, um, to start uh, training some other, training their staff or flight attendants on how to recognize the signs of a trafficking situation. And then other airlines also followed and then the hospitality industries also followed. We also uh, co-launched the first nationwide campaign against the sexual exploitation of children in travel and tourism, holding cross-country trainings for members of the industry and developing billboards featured in airports and partnering with travel agencies, tour operators, airlines, consulates, and embassies to disseminate awareness raising materials to travelers. So this is an example um, of a poster that we had in some of the airports and um, the images that we had on brochures that we developed. We trained young people to be the ones who actually trained the travel, uh, the travel and tourism sector in this case. Um, and then um, looking at, you know, I would add, you know, along with the, the four P's of the Palermo Protocol, I would also add a, a fifth P and that would be participation. Um, children, especially girls, you know, are meaningfully participate in all levels of, of, of decision making with one child. So members of our youth advisory squad, for instance, that you see there are trained in political advocacy and leadership so that they can be advocates and they can be peer educators in their communities. So we work also closely with survivors to ensure their voice is heard in the design of our programs. Um, so over the years since 2005, you know, we have been working and we've impacted the lives of over 76,000, um, and that includes at-risk children and survivors of human trafficking in across 11 countries. And we're essentially building what is a movement of a movement of young people, of, of children, and young people within the, the broader movement against uh, against child sex trafficking. And we're, we're just getting started. Wonderful. Um, well, 
I think you might have to unshare your screen. Yes. Um, <laughs> but um, no, just just wonderful and great to to hear um, how you can go from kind of that one person with that experience, as uh, as Charlotte said, experience of the heart, uh, and then move that out into to something much bigger. Um, Deepika, um, you guys have uh, also uh, taken one person's heart and then uh, really made it into a literally a global march. Um, can you talk to, uh, to us a little bit about um, not only the last uh, 20 some years of uh, the march, but uh, maybe even a little bit about how you yourself uh, have uh, made that emotional and advocacy journey within your organization? Yes, Lou, definitely. Uh, good evening, good morning, everyone. I will quickly just take you through uh, Global March Against Child Labor, the organization, the march, and what we are currently also doing. Uh, so Global March is a, it's a Southern-led network of civil society, trade unions, and teachers association. Uh, we are working to end child labor and uh, promote quality education for all. We are working across 40 countries with about 50 plus members. So uh, interestingly, our history, we were a physical march that actually took place in 1998 and 7 million people marched across 103 countries for almost six months. And this march culminated in Geneva uh, where the ILO Convention 182 on worst forms of child labor was being debated at that point in time. The demand from the marchers was that this uh, convention being adopted and also ratified globally. And interestingly, it is the only universally ratified ILO convention so far. Uh, that's been 22 years and we work at various levels like the community, the national, international levels. Uh, we kind of adopt a top to bottom or a bottom up approach. Uh, just to give an idea at the national and international levels, we are looking at advocacy and campaigns where we are addressing policy gaps and their implementation, building evidences, capacity building of stakeholders, uh, bringing a gender lens to the child labor discourse in all of our work. Uh, we support work through our members. And in the last five years, we have supported work in almost 20 countries. And currently we are working with seven in Asia and Africa. We represent the child labor discourse agenda at various international and regional platforms, the Alliance 8.7, where we occupy the civil society space on uh, child labor. We are also part of the migration and supply chain groups. We are very active at regional initiatives like the Latin American and Caribbean initiative and the South Asian initiative on violence against children. For us, uh, working with governments and UN agencies, members of parliament, NGOs is extremely critical. And here I would quickly like to talk about a unique initiative of Global March that we started in 2015. It's called Parliamentarians Without Borders for Children's mm -hmm. Rights. And uh, since 2015, we have organized three global, four regional and several national level meetings where you know, almost 100 MPs from 30 countries have come together across borders, across party lines to come and uh, not only talk about children's rights and child protection, but also prioritize this in their work at the constituency levels, in putting at national uh, policy making forums and at international uh, platforms as well. At the community level, we look at empowering communities and children through grassroots best, best practice models like the child-friendly villages. It's a right-based approach where we are uh, addressing issues of child labor trafficking at the root by empowering communities and children, where they get, uh, you know, they sen we sensitize them about their own rights and then they fight for them through the democratic structures that are created in this model, uh, such as a children's parliament women's group, youth groups. So it basically helps to bridge the gap between access to justice and the different social protection schemes that are there. And we're also fostering children who are also former child laborers to be themselves the champions and advocates for this cause. Lastly, uh, we look at, uh, we feel that dialogues with businesses is key and very critical to our work. And we're working with them to adopt a whole supply chain action or an approach with a focus on agriculture sector. Uh, we're also looking there at the area-based approach and linking different issues, for example, migration uh, when it comes up. 
The idea is to increase responsible business conduct uh, and ensure greater due diligence in supply chains, both locally and globally. Uh, Global March is um, signatory to two sector dialogues in the Netherlands, the food and the metal sector, a multi-stakeholder initiative started by the Dutch government and which includes signatories from businesses, uh, trade unions, governments, and CSOs. So that was in short our work uh, all uh, for these 22 years and I pass it back to Lou. Thank you so much Deepika and thank you for the work of uh, the Global March. Um, I've got so many questions from that I'm going to ask, but we also want to um, remind everybody uh, in the Q&A if you are thinking about questions. Um, the way we're going to do it today um, for interest of time um, is if you put the Q&As into the, the uh, Q&As and I will probably end up being the one that uh, ends up uh, reading them. Uh, so uh, I'll try to do uh, honor to uh, what people are putting into the Q&A. Um, but I uh, definitely want to have uh, Joha uh, join us uh, real quick and uh, we'd love to hear uh, Joha what you're up to uh, in Ghana. Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so Free the Slate, I'm Joha Brown, West Africa Regional Director. Uh, Free the Slate is celebrating our 20th anniversary. And there's a lot of anniversaries that are going on as well. TBPA, Palermo Protocol, ILO. Uh, it could be a period of celebration, but also something uh, a period to reflect on some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, Free the slaves um, have been working to change the conditions that allow modern slavery to exist. And our approach has been community-based and community-led, rooted in research and evidence-based. Um, so usually we will try to understand as much as possible the cultural context within every community that we are working in based on the findings in those communities we use those to design the program intervention so that community members can identify with the issue and then also inform the awareness raising intervention that goes on so for instance um, one of the tools that we use is a learning curriculum which is based on research conducted in the mining area and in the fishing area the findings of these were used to um, develop a booklet, a learning booklet, which is pictorial in nature. It's sort of a narrative pedagogy of the experiences of um, survivors as well as families in trafficking conditions. Uh, the experiences gathered in the community mobilization approach has led us to developing the community liberation model, which focuses on specific areas of our program intervention. Uh, these models are categorized in five, and they are on the screen as community education and mobilization. This training model has everything ranging from community identification, community entry, awareness raising, the type of groups um, to form in the communities. Uh, the next model is on liberation, care, reintegration, and the content of this model focuses on victim identification, rescue, rehabilitation, and reintegration. The rule of law model also focuses on global and national laws. The socioeconomic security model also focuses on developing livelihood of households and also of entire communities to reduce vulnerability. And we are looking at also the monitoring, learning, and evaluation this topic in particular is very pertinent in anti-trafficking movement in terms of how to measure the different kinds of intervention. Um, as uh, we, we, we progress with our programming, we are working on putting all these models online so that implementing partners or other organizations that are interested in this model can have access to the information online. And this process is ongoing. Our free the slaves approach is to work through grassroots partners. We don't do direct program implementation. Grassroots partners often have 
a certain level of permanency in the communities or geographical areas they work. They also understand the local context and the people better and are more trusted as compared to external uh, organizations. But often you also find that some of the grassroots NGOs lack the necessary um, capacity to implement anti-trafficking programming. So our collaborative work is aimed at building the capacity of these grassroots NGOs based on the five models that I mentioned previously. So they are more in the forefront and leading the program for us. Our coalition building is also one of the key components of FTS. We were instrumental in setting up the first human trafficking, anti-human trafficking coalition in Ghana and recently also supported in the formation of the uh, coalition of NGOs against child trafficking. We are still part of uh, that coalition process. Collaboration with government is very key in our work. Government agencies are part of the awareness raising programs in the communities. And this process helps facilitate um, trust between community members and then government agencies. We have also been active in the global uh, environment to influence um, global policy as well. We are on the board of International Cocoa Initiative, the Athens Coalition, the Child Coalition, the Child Labor Coalition, and Alliance 8.7. In 2015, FTS was part of the first child protection compact that was signed between the US government and any foreign government. And Ghana was the first country. So it was more of, let's say, experimental in the sense that most of the lessons of the subsequent child protection compacts are being uh, drawn from the experiences in Ghana. And the Child Protection Compact offered a unique uh, opportunity of partnership, in a sense, practicing the four Ps, prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnership uh, between government and non-governmental organizations. And this program helped to uh, accelerate the process of government and then community level engagement, where we are seeing community members developing their own development plans, which is submitted to government um, district assemblies for consideration in future uh, development intervention. In looking forward with our programs, Ghana is a new Alliance People's Seven Pathfinder country, and we are hoping that the achievement from our program intervention uh, will help accelerate Ghana's efforts to uh, achieve some of its commitments under the Alliance 8.7. For instance, the National Plan of Action against human trafficking is coming to an end. So it will be good to start engagement to shape how the next um, fight against trafficking will look like. There had been a consistent thread or description of the government of Ghana's effort in combating human trafficking in the TIP report which focuses around uh, payment of fine in lieu of prison term for a parent that traffics their child. But under Ghanaian law, you know, it's permissible, but in the tape report, it's, it's more of uh, a weakness that needs to be worked on. So these are areas that we think that engaging with stakeholders can help to shape um, the cause. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, I think that we've seen um, through our, I think you might have to stop screen sharing. Uh, John. There you go. Um, I think that what we've seen this morning, uh, this evening and tonight um, has been uh, three great organizations that have uh, come up uh, and uh, really made a difference. I find it very interesting that we see this parallel process of everything uh, not Cheryl's group, uh, but uh, all the, the, the kind of uh, other groups and other big processes, um, all kind of coming out of the late 1990s. Um, and I, my sense is that they um, were all responding to 
you know, kind of this big global moment of realizing something was going on. Um, but at the same time, um, only in recent years have we really seen the interconnectivity. Um, you've got the TVPA, Palermo, Convention 182, you've got the Harkin Engel Protocol, you've got the Fair Labor Association with CARMET, um, you've got the Global March, um, you've got associated organizations um, like Rugmark, um, the now Goodweave, um, you've got the three Ps. You know, all of these things seem to be coming out of the, the late 1990s, um, but in some ways were a little bit siloed. Um, and so I'd like to address the siloing problem um, in uh, our conversation. And we're going to, I think, just do uh, about four minutes or so uh, amongst ourselves. And then I'm going to ask some questions that are coming in uh, from the Q&A. Um, in fact, uh, Deepika, could we maybe start with you? Um, you know, this siloing issue, um, you know, how does the global march, um, and especially now that uh, Kailash is being seen, not simply kind of, you know, he is no longer kind of constrained to the mission of, of the global march or one organization, but he now kind of belongs to the world uh, with the Nobel Prize. Um, how do you think about de-siloing uh, and bridging those gaps that you mentioned in your, in your intervention, the gaps between the structures. Um, is Alliance 8.7 the way to go or what do you think? Uh, thank you, Lou. It's a very interesting question that you've put forward and I've been thinking I've, uh, about it is that um, I'll try and give a few examples where I feel de-siloing actually has already started and places where we can look at. One example would be Global March itself. I believe as a network organization, we already de-silo, you know, so many organizations working on the theme of say child labor, trafficking, slavery that came together and, you know, almost across 40 countries. So having a network already gets us together and we talk about related interrelated issues. Uh, the other would be for me, de-siloing great things to look at would be multi-stakeholder initiatives like the COCO initiative, for example, where both Free the Slaves and Global March are represented on the board. Um, you talk about the alliance. I believe, yes, uh, it's a very uh, important structure that has come into place and it is encouraging stakeholders from, you know, working on child labor, forced labor, trafficking, slavery, to really come together at international and regional levels. I believe at the national and community levels, there is still more work to be done uh, in terms of us, uh, you know, different actors collaborating more. But again, I would look back to the Alliance and say that they have given us, the Alliance 8.7 gives us a unique structure especially with the Pathfinder model, where it can, again, it has created a segue for us to come together. And forums like these, um, I, I believe they are also really important in this uh, thing that we would want to look at and wish for. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Brema, um, jo Joha, um, you, I think you have, by your service on the ICI board, um, not only the, the community work that uh, Free the Slaves does in Ghana, but thinking about kind of the, the big international uh, MSI. Um, there's been some folks that have critiqued uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives um, and the Harkin Engel protocol is now um, about to expire. Um, where do you see um, the ability to harness kind of these big multi-country, multi-stakeholder approaches um, going forward. Um, is there a way that we can uh, make them take us into the future in a better way? Yeah, I, I think that um, the, the main goal of most of these global uh, conventions are to have positive impact uh, at the community level. But most often there is a disjoint between how the policy is framed and the problem or the local dynamics that is supposed to tackle. So the need to galvanize um, communities um, to get a lot of support from them, 
they are experiencing the issues, they own their stories, so they need to tell their stories. And also who participates in the global policy formulation, for instance, um, the role of victims, the role of civil society, the role of government, and not just who participate, but then it's, again, what is also crucial is the timing of their involvement. Um, most often, some policies can go very far out before, let's say, survivor's voice are being heard. And they come way at the later end, at which point most of the, you know, the core uh, elements of policies are formed. So I think as long as we are keeping the voices of relevant stakeholders at each step of the way, then we'll be making progress in that regard. Well, and, and speaking of, of stakeholders and stakeholder voices, uh, Cheryl, I loved uh, YAS, or however you pronounce it, um, with the, the Youth Advisory Squad. Um, and uh, uh, those t-shirts are awesome. Um, how, how do you think that uh, folks, not just interested um, youth, um, but affected youth, um, how do we you know, take that community involvement um, and this, that survivor involvement um, and then power the next 20 years um, of the movement uh, by the people who themselves had been through what we're trying to fight? Well, I think we need to really build their capacity. So this could be in the form of providing um, survivors um, with mentorship, with skills development, resources, and opportunities for them to move from being storytellers, then to advocates, and then to decision makers and leaders. So this would mean, for instance, training them in areas like leadership, communication, public speaking, advocacy, awareness raising, um, even social entrepreneurship. Um, it could mean providing grants to run their own projects. Um, it could mean opportunities to, of course, to consult, to partner, to serve on advisory boards. Um, to implement programs and to take up senior leadership positions in organizations. So really, I think um, it's about kind of building their capacity to become these advocates and to become these leaders, um, as many of them often don't have those, those, uh, those skills at, at first. I'm going to ask some questions uh, that are coming in for the, through the Q&A, and I appreciate everybody uh, uh, sending in your questions. Um, we've got about uh, eight minutes or so for this segment, so it's going to be um, speed round type of uh, responses. Um, but I'm going to start with Cheryl, actually, um, because uh, what your guys are doing uh, up in Canada is focused more on uh, child sex trafficking uh, as opposed to uh, child labor on the part of the Global March um, or all forms of trafficking on the part of uh, Free the Slaves. Um, you know, there's been this thing, and certainly in the United States, and I think it's been in, in the UK as well, um, with um, whether it's, you know, call it uh, conspiracy theories or uh, mi perhaps misguided uh, or misinformed online activism uh, around child sex trafficking um, with a lot of kind of conspiratorial um, things. Um, and um, I think we lost Cheryl. Um, so uh, I'm going to hold on to this until she comes back. Um, but what I will note, and this was uh, put in by somebody who did not uh, say their name, um, is that in the United States, just this last week, the U.S. Um, anti-trafficking community um, in uh, large numbers uh, has come out strongly saying uh, the conspiracy theories, uh, saying that Hollywood or uh, liberal politicians or any particular uh, folks have a, a Satanistic pedophile ring uh, really ends up undercutting the work of the human trafficking organizations that are trying to uh, give voice to these communities, but also trying to find a, a place for people to stay at night uh, and try to bring them back into the community. And that, I think, brings us to Samantha Searle's um, question. And I'd uh, love this, um, uh, Dr. Brema, if you could answer uh, this one. Uh, she basically suggests that, uh, you know, we've got the 3P uh, protocol, uh, the 3P three, three paradigm over the last uh, 20 years, it's been a great way to kind of describe the work. Um, what type of other concepts would you like to, whether another P or otherwise, uh, would you like to add to that model? We've seen other people say restoration, rehabilitation, um, things like that. But if you could say three Ps and a something, 
Uh, what would that something be, Joha? Yeah, yes. Um, so I think when it comes to uh, models and the names that we assign to them, it's, then it, it's more about the implementation of the models to me per se. I think up to this point, there is um, enough concepts, um, laws, and other practices available that if they were being implemented effectively and efficiently, then most of the challenges that we are seeing will, will not necessarily be, be there. And we'll probably not need to come up with new terms if we are already having some models that are not being implemented efficiently. But of course, uh, in terms of terminologies, they are not static and they should be changing and evolving to, to meet our recent trends. So I think that um, it can still be changed. We can still add on, but we should take time to reflect on uh, the achievements or how efficient we have been in implementing the previous ones. So in some ways it's three Ps and an I, which is implement. Um, just go out and do what we say that we were we were going to do. Um, you know, I wonder, um, Deepika, if you could uh, address Venkat Reddy Regate's uh, question for us about how do we take forward the advocacy work uh, in the context of the fact that, you know, in some countries, civil society organizations are not um, in the same situation they were maybe 10 years ago, whether it's authoritarian countries or countries that are just not wanting to listen uh, and, or not wanting to support. With the Global March uh, being uh, you know, a very much a, a global membership uh, of CSOs, um, what are you seeing out there as far as this uh, troubling trend? Actually, this was one of the things that I wanted to leave the audience with, like looking forward, you know, two things that are really important and it's great that Venkat uh, kind of pointed it out, but yes, shrinking civil society space is really concerning for not just Global March, I believe, but across the world and right-wing authoritarian governments are coming to power and silencing freedom of speech and you know voices of dissent. We only see one way is to keep collaborating and, you know, so if there are, for, for example, for Global March, if we are present across 40 countries, the countries where there is still freedom of speech, you know, use those members to speak up um, directly, indirectly about this issue. Like when, for example, Brazil's president made some very, um, you know, difficult remarks around how he supports child labor. So we put out statements as the network from our board, uh, as the chair, sometimes Mr. Satyarthi as the Nobel laureate also writes to important leaders on these issues. So I think then the idea is for those who still have the voice to stand up even stronger and uh, continue this together because you never know when your country will put you into, you know, will put you to seizure or censure, sorry. So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Deepika. I wish that we had better news on this uh, right now. I think some of it is just all of us continuing to support each other and to be an early warning system for each other. India um, is going through difficult uh, issues as well with the government passing the latest FCRA regulations. They've made it almost impossible for NGOs to kind of survive. So, yeah. Exactly. Well, one thing that, um, and Luz Rooney asks about uh, latest prosecution trends and data collection technology, and I think I might take that one since I was a prosecutor for so long. Um, you know, for some reason this year, and it's a little hard to put, uh, next year we'll be able to say uh, it was COVID, um, but we also have to make sure that countries don't hide behind COVID um, as far as the fact that prosecution numbers are down. Um, and. Uh, I think that one of the things that we continue to see on prosecution numbers is that um, a lot of countries continue, despite the fact having a 3P system uh, technically in place, they continue to pursue kind of the old style outmoded League of Nations or even the, from the 1880s British laws um, and think of trafficking as simply the cross-border movement of people for prostitution. Um, or they think of it simply as child prostitution. And so then they end up not seeing the enslaved child laborers. They don't think of that as a slavery 
or a trafficking problem because it doesn't involve sex. Um, in the United States, we've seen the mix of sex and labor trafficking um, has uh, swerved to overwhelmingly uh, sex trafficking uh, investigations and prosecutions. Uh, and last night, um, it was uh, released by the uh, university uh, up in Syracuse that does the annual um, look at federal criminal prosecutions, um, that there has been a fall off even in child sex trafficking prosecutions uh, under the Trump administration, which I think uh, a lot of people assumed that it would go up under the Trump administration. Uh, even those cases have gone down. So I think that that notion of, as, uh, as Joha said, uh, if we've got these uh, laws on the books, we need to go out and implement them. Um, and it needs to be something that cuts across whether it's a, a one particular government, uh, whether it's conservative, liberal, uh, what have you, this needs to be something that happens across um, all of the different political parties. Um, we've only got about three minutes left and Joha, I'm gonna ask, ask you, um, and I know that we've got an entire day's worth of this as well, but I'm gonna ask you about um, Ali Boak's uh, question uh, about the donor community where have they stepped up? Where do we need them to step up? Are they, and I'm gonna add one sub question, which is, have they been stepping up in the right place? Are the right things being funded? Over to you, Joha. Thanks. Not, a, uh, not the uh, least controversial question <laughs> to throw to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so um, my take on that is, um, if, if you put this question to the donor community, they'll probably say they've stepped up. And if you put it to the civil society, we'll probably say they haven't stepped up enough, although they have certainly stepped up in some areas. Um, that is because the, the scale of the problem and the funds available at, do not just match. And also I can speak to, for instance, in Ghanaian context where a lot of the funding that comes in that we see are very uh, short term in nature, two years, sometimes one year, and those kind of funds are not just significant to cause any change in a community. Because from experience, we know that we need at least a minimum of three years in a community to be able uh, to see significant changes uh, in attitude and behavior. And also, um, most of the funding also tend to be sector oriented as opposed to being holistic. So you have a situation where you are, you are pushing the problem from one area into another area or sector. So we probably have to look at it uh, from that context to, to make a judgment as to whether the donors are stepping up uh, in the right places and significantly. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Dibika and Joha. I'm sorry that we uh, lost Cheryl. I'm going to um, move it over uh, to Sean now uh, to close. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I think that one of the things that we've seen, um, and with Joha's last uh, intervention, this notion of we have to really build effectiveness uh, into what we're doing. We have to be doing it with one hand, measuring effectiveness uh, with the other. Um, and I think that uh, we'll be able to tell a much better story. Um, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Sean, for hosting us. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Lou, and panelists, for a terrific discussion. On behalf of the Freedom from Slavery Forum and the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale, our thanks to everybody who joined from around the world for this terrific program. I'll just offer a quick takeaway thought. Um, I was really inspired by Hillary Clinton's call for making this a decade of determination. And from my own work in labor rights and supply chains, I'm particularly eager to work with all of you around the world to make sure that as migration increases due to rising inequality and climate change, that we figure out how to press the right levers of policy to make sure that there's less vulnerability to trafficking. I really encourage all of you to use the chat function to put in some concluding uh, feedback yourself closing remarks yourself so that we can include them in our report and, and absorb them and think about them for, for future programming. So tomorrow, our forum will focus on empowering and learning from survivors. We'll have another remarkable lineup featuring many survivor activists and leaders. It will be the same Zoom link at the same time. So I hope you can join us then. In the meantime, thank you and goodbye until tomorrow. <laughs>